We're here today with Jeffrey Canada, the founder of the Harlem Children's Zone and a board member of XQ. Uh, Jeffrey, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thrilled to be here. Very excited. Thank you. Jeff, somewhere today in Harlem, there is a newborn baby who's going to come home for the first time and start his or her life in the hundred blocks of the Harlem Children's Zone. Can you tell us the story of what that kid's life is going to look like moving forward and all the ways the Harlem Children's Zone is going to touch that kid's upbringing? So here's one of the uh, most exciting things I think about our work over the last 20 years. Uh, Probably about 85% of the children between zero and three have gone to what we call baby college. So we have this massive outreach looking for uh, pregnant moms, uh, moms with very young children, and getting them to come to our baby college because the science on brain development, especially between zero to three, uh, it's so profound the impact this has on that child's life and life trajectory uh, that we felt like we had to bring the best thinking uh, and the best practice around brain development to our families in Harlem. And so uh, we get those parents, they come to our Saturday classes, uh, and we try to make sure that they start their lives knowing as much as any middle class family in America. And what's some of the key content in baby college? What, uh, um, what are those parents learning to help those kids get off to a great start? Yes, we're trying to help parents understand that uh, no matter what their education background, whether they finished high school or even finished elementary school, uh, they can be great teachers in their child's life. That that child needs to hear rich language, uh, not just, uh, you know, pick up uh, the piece of paper, but it's a white piece of paper on the floor. You try and just make sure that child is hearing constantly uh, sort of these verbal cues about their environment. So because kids intuitively learn that way. Uh, that singing to your child is important, that uh, playing all of that play with that back and forth serving response that parents do with their child is actually rewiring that brain uh, for language, uh, which that child will need for the rest of their life. We try to make sure our parents know that they can't do negative things. You can't yell uh, or curse uh, or physically abuse a child because it has a lasting impact on that brain. Uh, that uh, we know is harmful to that child's development. Uh, so we're trying to give our parents all of the tips and tools. You know, one of the things, especially in African-American families, parents were taught that good kids are quiet kids, kids who don't talk back, kids who don't ask questions. Well, the science is all against that. We want kids who constantly question, uh, who constantly want to express their ideas and their views to their parents. And so we're just trying to change some of these cultural traditions to ways that are going to be more uh, beneficial to that child's growing up. That's good. So as my uh, six-year-old, my eight-year-old daughters are sassing back to me, I can know that I'm doing the right thing because they're, uh, they're asking me all kinds of questions about why I have to do this and why I don't take care of them better and things like that. So, so your kids graduate from baby college, and then how else does the Harlem Children's Zone engage these students as they go through school? Well, we have a uh, pre-K program uh, for our three and four-year-olds uh, that starts at eight o'clock in the morning and goes till uh, five or six o'clock in the evening. Uh, and it's really designed to try to make up for some of the language acquisition uh, deficit so many of our children face early on in life. You know, um, if you have a college education and your spouse has a college education, the kind of vocabulary you use, the kind of sentence structure, the kind of, uh, I think, descriptions that you use are really quite different in its vividness and its richness from folks who don't have that background experience. And it uh, impacts children in a very dramatic way when they just don't get as many words so we're really focused on language development and on the pre-reading skills and on kids learning their sight words so that they enter kindergarten ready to learn, that they're on grade level when they enter kindergarten and they don't start off behind. So uh, we go right from baby college where we're working with parents around all of these kind of good practices into our four-year-old program, which we call Harlem Gems, 
uh, which is really designed to make sure our children enter kindergarten uh, prepared and on grade level. And then as kids go into schools, one of the features of the Harlem Children's Zone is that um, this kind of home support, this kind of reaching out to all the various needs of the kids is something that just continues through the next 12 years as they're part of the Promise Academies that are in the Harlem Children's Zone. How, how do your schools and teachers um, think about meeting the needs of kids sort of in the classroom and beyond the classroom? So here's the, one of the, um, I think, things about our work that most folks don't understand, you know. So yes, we have this pipeline that starts with baby college, goes to our Harlem Gym four-year-olds, and then we stay with kids throughout their elementary, middle, high school, and we get our kids into college and then through college. So we've got more than 950 kids in college right now but only about 20% of those kids went to our charter schools. Most of our kids in the Harlem Children's Zone go to traditional public schools, and we work them, with them during the school day, after school, evenings, weekends, summertime, uh, and we provide not only direct educational support, but we provide the arts and the sports uh, and also the cultural supports that our kids need, engaging them in service in their community, uh, teaching them about anti-violence strategies, uh, trying to make sure that these kids grow up knowing that a college is in their future. Uh, so we believe in working with the whole child. Uh, and we find that so many places, people feel like they have to make a choice. Do we focus on education or do we focus on the arts? Uh, do we focus on uh, making sure the kids are doing well in school or are we thinking about creating great sports programs or civic programs for kids, nutrition, health, mental health? We say you have to do all of that. Here's the rub. In middle class communities and upper middle class communities, we do all of that for our children. And we're still terrified that our kids might not make it into the right school, the right middle school, the right high school, the right college. In poor communities, we think those kids have to give up half of that stuff. They have to have poor mental health services. They have to have poor health services, so-so uh, -so schools, uh, not really structured after school activities, no access to organized sports because they don't have money to pay for it and we think they're gonna be competitive with these other students. I mean, that simply does not compute. Uh, we think you have to provide all of those services for kids, and it's not going to level the playing field completely because still parents matter, and your parent having a college education is a huge advantage uh, for children whose parents don't. But we think this is the minimum. This is the floor that poor children have to have, not the ceiling, People look at our work and they say, wow, you're dealing with health care and mental health care and wow, that's great. No, that's just the floor of what our kids need if they're going to overcome all of the challenges that poverty presents children in this country. Across your team, how do you think about the stakes of this work? Um, what does equity mean for um, the 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 different staff in the Harlem's Children's Zone, of all the different gaps that are out there, you're trying to close all of them. Are there some that seem sort of most important to you to be attentive to? That's a, that's a great question uh, because people are going to be unsatisfied with my answer, which is, no, they're all important. I mean, here's the one thing that I think we've learned, uh, that uh, all of these sorts of uh, challenges folks face in their life uh, really matter. And, and this is uh, what I mean by that. So we, we were getting our kids uh, through high school and we're getting them in college, but we had this huge obesity sort of epic uh, epidemic in our community. So we have kids who are becoming overweight at significant uh, numbers and at percentages. And we know what does that do? it shortens your lifespan significantly. You're more likely to have heart attack, more likely to get cancer, more likely to have high blood pressure, more likely to have diabetes, more likely to end up having parts of your body amputated, all because of poor nutrition uh, and lack of exercise. So here we're spending all of this time and energy trying to get our kids prepared for college so they could be successful when we know if we don't deal with this health issue, 10 to 15 years of their life 
is going to be taken off because of these health reasons. So someone might say, well, how can you afford uh, to do that? And what we say, how can you afford not to? We want kids, if you really want equity, then we want our kids not only getting jobs and being able to take care of their family, but we want them to be as healthy as other folk growing up uh, in this country. And I'll give you uh, a reason this has become so clear to me. You know, at, at 67, uh, I grew up in the South Bronx, uh, and they have something uh, that they call Old Timers Day. They get a lot of the guys who grew up in the South Bronx to go, and every the first Sunday in August, everybody goes to the playground, and, you know, we play those silly little games, and it's really pathetic stickball and other things that most of us can't play anymore. Well, f- and, the, and the kids are watching you saying, like, what are these old people doing? What is that game? Why is it? You know? <laughs> right. Well, about five years ago, uh, I stopped going. Uh, there's nobody left alive uh, that I grew up with. The end result of poverty and what it does is not just lack of uh, jobs and education, but you see huge numbers of uh, poor folks dying at much earlier ages uh, when you should be at the prime of your life. Retirement age, things are going well. There's no one left around who was poor. Uh, I don't want that for my kids. I want them to have this full comprehensive set of equitable outcomes that's not just around jobs and education and housing, but also around life expectancy uh, and them growing up in a community that values them uh, for the long haul, not just their fourth grade reading scores, is something that we care about in the zone. For the teachers in your school, uh, in in your school, both in the in the charter schools that you help to run, and in the other schools uh, in the Harlem Children's Zone, what are their what do you see as their responsibilities um, related to all of the other all the kind of non academic goals you have? I mean, you know, if, as as you're looking at teachers and you're looking at this whole system, and you're thinking, you know, it's the math teacher's job to teach math, and then what we have to do is wrap that math classroom around with all these other services or engagements. Or what role does the the math teacher the earth science teacher, the English teacher have um, in addressing all of the challenges that these kids have that impact their learning in those classrooms? So, so here's one of, I think, the real challenges that our education system has failed to come to grips with. Uh, it is hard enough to teach a child uh, who is two years behind academically. Uh, the subject matter that you're th- that you're there being paid to teach that child, uh, let's say science or uh, English language arts. Uh, if then I have to be a social worker uh, and a nurse uh, at the same time, uh, maybe a housing specialist because the child's uh, family is homeless. Uh, this is too much to ask of any educator. It's almost too much to ask them just to catch up to two years, Mm -hmm. much less to do provide all of these other services and supports. The failure of the education system is that we have not learned to partner with other institutions to help provide these services that all children need. Uh, I don't think the teacher can provide them. I don't think the school can provide them. I think the school has to be a place that brings in other resources so the student needs get met. Uh, I'll give you a classic example of what uh, really uh, upsets me. Uh, There will be, and this is one of the sad things going on in this country, there will be within the next three or four weeks uh, some shooting in some school somewhere in America. This is now just part of what we've allowed to happen to our kids, and I think it's an outrage. Uh, After that happens, uh, you will hear... Uh, the leaders of that community come out and talk about how there will be counselors there for all of the students and all of the teachers because we know how tragic this incident was and it's going to have an impact on these kids every day in Chicago, in Detroit, in New York, in Minneapolis. There are kids who know folks who are being shot and killed, Uh, friends and peers, uh, and they come to school and nothing happens. No one cares about their mental health. No one says, oh my goodness, this community is under shock. Uh, Maybe the kids go out and light some candles in some place. That's the most response we have. Why is it in some communities, uh, we think it's totally normal to provide kids 
with mental health supports if they've gone through trauma. With all we're learning about toxic stress and the trauma from advanced, adverse childhood experiences, ACEs and all of that kind of stuff, why isn't this just normal and everyday experience that we know all of our kids who suffer trauma need help and support, uh, but it only happens in the more wealthy and the more affluent communities in this country. Uh, that's where schools have failed. Uh, we don't expect the schools to do it by themselves, but they have to figure out a way to partner with other folks to make sure these supports and services come into the schools where they're needed. Are there other schools in the country that you feel like have done a great job ad adopting some of these lessons, adopting parts of these models? Are there places that you're looking to and going, oh, we got to keep track of what's happening in that neighborhood or in that school because they're doing some things that we could really learn from? Uh, I, I have seen places around the country that I'm really excited about. Uh, in fact, I'll be going out to Minneapolis. Uh, they have a Northside Achievement Zone out there. They're really working to make sure you bring these comprehensive supports in school. Uh, I was in Salt Lake City, Utah two weeks ago uh, and was watching the work that the United Way is doing out there uh, with their schools where they're bringing in these supports and services to schools. Uh, they're just a, a number, you know, you have the community and schools movement across this country where they're really trying to bring services and supports into schools. So I think that we're making some progress, but it has been uh, haphazard. Uh, it has not been fully supported either with the resources necessary to scale this or, or to bring in the quality that we need to bring into these schools. So we've got some good examples. Uh, but we don't need uh, 50, we need a thousand of these really great examples uh, happening around this country. And we've got to start a movement to really bring in these more comprehensive supports into schools. Which is not, by the way, uh, suggesting that that's the answer to kids failing, right, academic subject areas. And I just want to be clear about that. Some people think, well, the kids are failing in this school, so what they need is comprehensive supports. But if there's not quality teaching and instruction going on in that school, you can bring all the quality support you want. It's not going to improve the academic outcomes. This is that we have to do both of those. We have to focus on the quality teaching, but at the same time bring in comprehensive support for kids who need them. And that's this notion that it's not about getting one or two new things right. It's really trying to get everything right. It's trying to sort of wake up every day and be like, you know, kids are complex people. They have lots of different needs. They have academic, social, civic. We have all these goals for them, and we need to be working on each of them um, in order for our students to thrive. Um, in terms of that academic support, I uh, so I was looking at the Harlem Children's Zone website um, and looking at some job descriptions for some people that you're hiring, um, and I wanted to read one of them to you um, and just have you sort of reflect on like what in this job description do you think is sort of cueing people about what Harlem Children's Zone thinks good teaching and learning is? Because this seemed like a great opportunity to me. Um, so we're seeking a cosmetology teaching artist with experience, expertise and an understanding of how to adapt a cosmetology curriculum to an after-school setting. The ideal candidate will be able to teach students to present. They will expose students to available technologies and programming through a designed curriculum through a series of projects designed by students. The cosmetology teaching artist must be able to motivate and maintain the interest of students while setting a positive example and take a sincere, active, and appropriate interest in the well-being and success of all students. Um, what, are, what, are, what are some of the words or sort of cues in there that tell us something about what you all think good teaching and learning looks like? Well, I, well, I think there's this real focus on meeting student needs, right? That, that you have to understand that these students are your number one uh, sort of customer, uh, and they have their own needs. And I, I, in hearing this, I'm thinking, uh, to my, I don't know this for a fact because I haven't spoken to the staff about this particular job, but I'm saying I'm almost sure our students said, I'm inter you ask kids, what do you want to be? What are you interested in? I'm sure a number of students says cosmetology, yep. probably without knowing an awful lot about it, but they've heard about it. And so finding someone who could bring this to life for them, not saying, well, therefore, you're going to go and become a professional in this arena, but here's an area that you care about. There's probably all kinds of vocabulary and science and all kinds of good stuff kids are going to learn after school about that. Some may very well take it as a career trajectory and continue moving on with that. But the key is finding someone 
who is passionate not only about the knowledge, but passionate about children and passionate about the children's wants and desires being key to how they're going to approach this class. Uh, and I think that's what great, great teaching and instruction really is. You are passionate, but you're passionate about bringing that knowledge forward, but doing so in a way that's helping kids make sense out of their universe, which is what I think a great education is all about. You know, and th I mean, when I read the job description, um, the sort of emphasis on project-based learning, the emphasis on how are we going to get kids doing these things and think thinking some of the same things of like, you know, for some cosmetology career, for almost all of us, like trying to look good is part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's part of our social relations with each other as we meet other people, we create communities around these kinds of things. Um, it just struck me as a really neat opportunity. And I have two young daughters right now who I'm sure would think that uh, an after-school program in cosmetology would be super fun. Um, what, when you're visiting schools in um, the Harlem Children's Zone, what are some of the things that you're looking for in classrooms that are indicative to you um, that teachers are really meeting the needs of individual students? What are, what, do you, what are the things that sort of distinguish the classrooms where you walk in and go, okay, I'm pretty sure that there's some pretty powerful learning that's happening in here? So, so you know, it's, it's interesting because um, I would love to say that all subjects being taught in schools are equally exciting, but that is simply not true, right? There's some kids who are really excited about math and some kids who really don't like math, and the same for science and the arts and other things. A great teacher brings excitement to an area for all students. Uh, whether, you know, I, I know a lot of kids tell me, no, I'm not good at math. A great math teacher will convince you that you actually are good at math, that you actually can understand uh, very complicated uh, information. So when I walk into a classroom, the first thing I'm looking at is student engagement. Are the students engaged or are they sleeping? Are they paying attention? Is it that the first kids in the front row are really into it and then as you go further to the back, you see less and less interest? And you're looking at where, how this teacher responds to students. Do, do they call only on the kids whose hand shoots up immediately when the teacher asks a question? Or are they looking to see which kids are figuring things out and giving those kids an opportunity to say, oh yeah, I think I understand, and get that hand out and call on a kid who doesn't get to speak that often? Uh, I really uh, love when I find kids who are answering questions, uh, getting the questions partially right, but not being afraid when the teacher said, well, part of that's right, but here's another one. Keep thinking about this, and it doesn't shut down uh, the response of kids. You know, so many times you're taught that it's an all or none. I I'm right or I'm wrong, and if you're wrong, you feel deflated, you probably don't want to raise your hand again. How teachers engage students so that they realize that this is an iterative process, uh, we're both learning, we're both trying to figure things out, and it's okay to be wrong. That's not like a demerit all of a sudden, or oh, you failed. That's part of learning, to me, is what great teaching looks like. Uh, and when, when I see that kid who struggled and didn't get it all right, but their hand is up again because, okay, I think I got it this time, that's, that's when you know that teacher's a master teacher, and that's a great class. When, the, when part of what you're seeing is kids sort of leaning into that struggle, knowing that it's safe to make mistakes and knowing that the teacher is being attentive to what they're saying and helping them say, okay, here's some of the thinking that you're doing that's like how a mathematician thinks or likes how a historian thinks. And here's some of the thinking that you're doing that we want to cultivate and build on and change and grow um, and helping people uh, helping people see those pieces. Um, oh, yeah. Cause, you know, so, so, much of it, so much of classroom instruction, if we forget what's supposed to be happening, kids are supposed to be learning. To be learning it means they don't know, right? And if you're punished if you don't know, if you feel bad because you don't know, then it's going to really inhibit learning. And I think that folks who really embrace this, that this is a learning environment, and most of learning is admitting I don't know something and I'm trying to get better at it, uh, that's what we really want to see uh, young people doing. Uh, when, when you think learning is simply I know the answer and I'm regurgitating it to the teacher so I look so, you know, smart, you know, that works for some folks. It doesn't work for most of the kids who come from struggling backgrounds who need that constant feedback that says, great, keep trying. It's okay that you didn't get it the first time. Don't give up. You know, it's funny. I've, uh, we've just started classes here at MIT the last couple of weeks, and we have kids from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, 
but uh, I was telling them a story from my own um, uh, 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 college experience where I was taking a class and um, about three classes into it, I went to the professor and said, I really think I don't understand maybe every third word that you're saying. I'm really struggling here. And he just said, that is so great. I'm so glad you're here. Um, if you knew all of this stuff, we wouldn't need you to take this class, but you know, stick with it and we're going to get it together. Um, so I've been telling my uh, undergraduates at MIT a, a similar kind of message of, uh, of sticking with it and keep putting your hand up and keep jumping in as you understand things or as you don't. Um, what is what is professional learning for teachers, um, you know, in Harlem schools or in the Harlem Children's Zone or in the after school programs look like um, as people are entering the profession, as they're sticking with the profession? What are some of the themes that you all come back to year after year in helping teachers become better teachers? So this is uh, such a fascinating uh, area because uh, I, I tell people, and I honestly believe this, that uh, teaching when, when you're teaching for a living, it's one of the most complicated and difficult jobs uh, that you can do. Uh, I mean, there are these sort of unknowns. There, there's not a teacher who walks in that classroom in the morning who knows what they're going to face, right? Because you've got a bunch of kids who've had a bunch of different experiences, some good, some bad, some that's going to be helpful, some that's going to be unhelpful. And that's every single day you go to work. Uh, and what we have done is essentially... Uh, train teachers to a minimum threshold, put them in those classrooms and say, you know, we'll see you uh, in two months, we'll do an in-service training, hope everything goes well. Uh, we're, uh, that's any, what the educational system in general has done. We give, we give people a minimum BA and we send them in there and say, you know, there'll be a, there'll be a lecture on project-based learning a month from now. Good luck. Look, I, I started my career teaching uh, I was all excited in high school. I, I went to my class. The principal said, you know, Jeff, uh, go get him. I didn't see the person again for six months. And, and there I was not even knowing if I was doing a good job, right? Because there was no one there. Uh, I tell folk, uh, if I'm correct, that teaching is as complicated and as difficult as I think it is. And no other profession. You know, uh, you wouldn't do this in law. You would never get your first year law student and give them the toughest case and say, yeah, go to court, figure it out, do the best you can do, you know, and then come see me afterwards. You would never, ever go and be a medical doctor and just like, yeah, I know you don't know it all, but just go in there and try and figure it out. In education, that's what we've done, and we've done it poorly. So when you say, what's the difference? Once a week, we're meeting with our teachers, uh, and we're going over uh, the best practice. Uh, we're going in, we're using video so people can actually, because you think you're doing something you're not doing, right? We're all subject to believing, oh yeah, I, I had the whole class engaged. Meanwhile, people are like, no, you saw those four kids over there, and when you say the person, no, 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 it wasn't true, the video doesn't lie. You actually get the chance, to say, oh, really? They really weren't paying attention. Isn't that true? So it's a way of us uh, just helping folks grow uh, in this business. So much of teaching, the critique of teaching, people feel like is negative. You're saying I'm not very good or, or I did that wrong. What we're trying to say to folks, this is a lifelong uh, sort of uh, effort of learning. Uh, there's no doctor who thinks I finally got it all. I'm never, I don't need to learn one more thing, right? I've mastered all of medicine. I mean, this is foolish. Every day, every week, there's new science coming out uh, that folks have to know. So it is in education, and we're trying to make sure on a regular basis we're showing and exposing our teachers to the best, but we're also going to other places. We're going to look for folks who are doing it better than us. Let's go check it out and see what they're doing. And you come back with your team and say, okay, what did we learn from that experience? Look, uh, folks, uh, there's no uh, sort of uh, real educational advantage to pretending you know it all or you can do it all. It's just simply not true. All of us have to continue to learn, and there's somebody out there who can help all of us figure out how to do it better. We're trying to make sure we're giving our teachers as much support on a regular weekly basis, but also exposing them to folks who are doing something really different and getting even better results. Uh, we think that that's gonna be the way our practice is gonna go for as long as we run schools. 
in the Harlem Children's Zone, what does the next level of work for you all look like as you think about the sort of organizational, institutional challenges of the next few years? Um, what are the things that you're trying to get better at? What are the things that you're trying to refine? What, what are the challenges that you've encountered that just are harder than even you expected or, or things that are more important um, that have surprised you? Well, there's, you know, folks are really becoming more comfortable with this cradle to career perspective on uh, youth development, educational support. Um, we're now sort of looking at how do we improve our college retention, our college graduation, but also how do we then connect those kids to the labor market? Because here's, here's again, you keep thinking, okay, we figure this out, you come home with a college degree, it's good. But there's no, there's no parent, I've got three kids who've gone through college. There's none of us who thought, oh yeah, you came through with your college degree, it's good. We all continue to help our kids get connected to the labor market. We call our friends, our colleagues, folks we know, do you know of any jobs? Our kids have nobody to help with that at all. Uh, they don't have people who will write the references for them, who will co make a call for them. So we started thinking more and more about how do we connect kids to the labor market uh, in a real way so that uh, we finish this a pipeline with our kids having a successful job and earning a decent living. So that's one area. We're also spending a lot more time uh, talking to other communities around the country that's interested uh, in doing this work. Uh, I think the evidence is becoming clearer and clearer uh, that the place matters, that uh, there are some places that have so many challenges that kids have to overcome uh, that it makes it almost impossible for them to reach their full potential. It doesn't mean some kids don't get out and go on with their life. It just means most kids in those places don't reach their full potential. And we've got to change that. And we think uh, this approach of working in a place and trying to provide comprehensive supports to kids, as well as their families, as well as the neighborhoods and communities they live in, uh, is one of the keys if we're going to really reverse generational poverty in this country. Well, we started talking about baby college and then we've made it all the way to entering the labor market. So we've got this sort of full, um, you call it cradle to college, but now maybe it's sort of cradle to workforce, cradle to civics uh, approach. If there are teachers and school leaders who are listening to this, maybe these are the people that you're talking to as you're visiting other places and saying, you know, our community hasn't started much of this, but this is really our direction we should go. Do you have thoughts about like, what's the right sort of first step that a teacher or, or a school leader um, can take towards this journey? Like what's, what's, the, what's the right place to start this work? I mean, it, it, this is again, a, it's a terrific question. Uh, when, when I began teaching, uh, there just weren't a lot of places that you could go to see folks who have actually done it, right? And say, wow, let's go check this out and see what they've actually done. There wasn't, there obviously wasn't a lot written about it. There were some folks who were writing about it, but mostly they were writing about the challenges, right? Jonathan Kozel and some of the others really saying, hey, there's something going on and it's really different in these places than in these other places. Now there are folks who have actively gone out and actually tackled these issues with some success. It's not just the work that we've done here at the Harlem Children's Zone or the other charter school networks, or KIPP Academy, Achievement for, for some of those places, uh, but there's a lot of writing right now that's going on uh, that you can go online and find out some of what matters. Uh, if folks are interested, I mean, XQ has just a whole library of supports for folks who are interested in high school that you can just go online, find access to this stuff, uh, find the best thinking in the country in one place. Uh, you begin to see more and more information online about great teaching. Some of the stuff at Khan Academy and others are like, hey, let's just make this available. So today I will say to, to teachers and administrators, there's no excuse not to know what's going on. Uh, back in the old days, uh, we would have to at least wait for a magazine to come out or you know, go to the library and research something and try. Now just pick up your phone and search for the best practice out there and you will find tons of information that will help you become a better educator. And I think that the, the, the most important thing to know is that none of us have this thing perfectly. None of us have it all figured out. Uh, we're still in the early science of trying to figure out how to scale educational success for poor children, right? That's still part of the science we're working on. We're a lot better than we used to be. 
but we still got a long way to go. And so all of us need to constantly be thinking about how do I improve my practice? Who else is doing it better? Where can I go see something? Where's there a video or something on YouTube or someone who's teaching this subject area that might be doing it better than me? Uh, if we do that, our practice will absolutely improve. I couldn't agree more. Uh, Jeffrey, this has been a fabulous conversation. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. It's absolutely been my pleasure, and thank you for hosting me.